ultimately the patient will not be affordable but we are keen to know the uh, indications and the advantages of uh, giving immunotherapy in urothelial malignancy. So the outline of my presentation would be like to answer the question. So there are, will be multiple questions and then answer session like that I will uh, plan. So the first, what is the role of immunotherapy in the non-muscle invasive bladder carcinoma? Second one was in any role in muscle invasive bladder carcinoma. Third one was what is the role in the metastatic setting? Again in the metastatic setting, what is the role in the maintenance setting? That is in the first line. And what is the role in the first line setting and in the second line setting? So these are all the indications where we can use uh, immunotherapy in the uh, urothelial malignancy. So first coming to the uh, non-muscle invasive bladder, uh, bladder carcinoma. So as previously speakers has told that the majority of the patients, the management is like uh, TURBT has to be done and after that intravesical BCG has to be done. Whenever a patient becomes BCG unresponsive, non-muscle invasive bladder carcinoma and patients who are ineligible or refusing cystectomy. The ideal treatment if the patient fails BCG would be the cystectomy. If the patient refuses a cystectomy, then the option of pembrolizumab will be there. There is only phase 2 data available for uh, giving pembrolizumab in these settings. A lot of phase 3 studies are ongoing. So per se, you can say that there is an ongoing trials happening in the non-muscle invasive bladder carcinoma which has shown some benefit in the phase 2 studies. But not yet, uh, till now we cannot recommend pembrolizumab or immunotherapy in non-muscle invasive bladder carcinoma. So this will be your answer to the patient whenever a non-muscle invasive bladder carcinoma BCG refractory patient comes to you and asks, is there any role for immunotherapy? Yes, is, there is a role for immunotherapy. There are phase 2 evidence is there, but phase 3 studies are ongoing and we have to wait uh, for the studies to come. Next, so I have completed non-muscle invasive. Next, coming to the uh, another setting that is muscle invasive bladder carcinoma. So I will just give a clinical scenario and then let's see how you will manage this patient. So a 65 year old male patient who is no comorbidities has been evaluated for the urinary symptoms and the cystoscopy has been done for this patient and followed by the TURBT has been done and it has determined a large mass of somewhere around 5 centimeters over the right lateral wall and the pathology of the uh, specimen came out to be high grade papillary carcinoma with the muscularis propria invasion that is the involvement of the muscle which has been consistent with the P2 2 disease. And then we have done the staging workup with the CT scan. CT scan was showing no evidence of any metastasis. So this thing will be, it is a non-metastatic muscle invasive bladder carcinoma. Then comes the question whether the patient is cisplatin eligible or cisplatin ineligible. So as previous speakers and Dr. Uh, Avinash sir also has discussed, if the patient is cisplatin eligible in the muscle invasive bladder carcinoma, the preferred approach should be four cycles of gemcitabine cisplatin. And after that, if the CT scan shows partial response or stable disease, then we can proceed with the cystectomy. So, for this patient, uh, if you consider one scenario, if he is a cisplatin ineligible, has received four cycles of chemotherapy, after that CT scan was done, which showed partial response, and then underwent surgery. The staging of the patient was PT3N0. And the another situation was, patient is cisplatin ineligible, muscle invasive bladder carcinoma, for which patient has opted for the upfront radical cystectomy. And here the staging was again PT3N0. So these two patients come to your OPD and ask you, sir, is there any role for immunotherapy for my patient? Again, so we will look into that. The patient of muscle invasive bladder carcinoma, cisplatin ineligible, post chemotherapy and post surgery, is there any role? Cisplatin ineligible patients, upfront surgery, not fit for cisplatin, is there any role? So there are adjuvant immunotherapy trials has been ongoing in this high-risk bladder carcinoma. Three trials are the uh, main important trials. I am Weigel 10 trial, Checkmate 274 and Ambassador trial. Of this, the first trial is negative and it has shown no evidence, uh, no benefit of immunotherapy in the adjuvant setting. And the third trial that is Ambassador trial has completed accrual, the results are awaiting, it is an ongoing trial. And the only trial which has results has been published was Checkmate 274 trial, uh, which has used nivolumab in the adjuvant setting and I will be discussing regarding this trial in the next few slides. So coming to the key inclusion criteria, so if you look at the inclusion criteria of this trial, the first inclusion criteria was PYPT2 or T4A or node positive disease who received neoadjuvant cisplatin chemotherapy. So this criteria, the one of our first patient like cisplatin eligible patient who completed uh, chemotherapy and then underwent cystectomy. So this patient will fit into the trial criteria. Similarly, if you look at the second inclusion criteria, patient with PT3, T4 or node positive, patient who has not received any neoadjuvant chemotherapy but underwent upfront surgery. So that patient is also included in this trial. So this trial uh, describes or includes the both the clinical scenarios what I have explained earlier. So patient received near joint chemotherapy and then surgery after that any role. Patient not received chemotherapy, underwent upfront surgery, is there any role? 
and then they have randomized this to uh, nivolumab it has to be given two weekly for a duration of one year and it has been compared with the observation that is placebo so what is the uh, results was if you look at the C, uh, the overall population here if you look at the overall uh, population the survival disease free survival data there is slight improvement in the disease free survival in the overall population but if you look at the pdl1 positive patient so if ever if ever a patient tested positive for pdl1 then the difference of this disease free survival is very high somewhere around the if you use placebo it is around 10 months if you use immunotherapy it is somewhere around 54 months so the disease free survival benefit of 44 months has been seen in patients who are tested pdl1 positive in the adjuvant setting so again one more sub uh, subgroup analysis has been done and what they have noted was patient who received near adjuvant cisplatin chemotherapy followed by surgery and if they receive uh, immunotherapy they did quite better when compared to patient who has not received uh, pre operative chemotherapy so with these two slides so my take home point from this uh, trial would be like if any patient comes to me and if for the adjuvant immunotherapy if the patient test positive for the pdl1 then i will say that is there there is a role there is a dfs benefit is there then we can consider immunotherapy in such situation if a patient has been treated with in near adjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery again yes there is a role again there is a dfs benefit is there then i will suggest for the uh, uh, immunotherapy but if the patient tested negative for the pdl1 then the likelihood of benefit is low so in that situation i would not uh, suggest the uh, immunotherapy in the adjuvant setting so the take home point in this one would be the disease free survival is benefit is there in a patient who has been tested positive for pdl1 but there is no overall survival benefit the overall survival data is yet to come so that's why we can call it as a a standard of care but not the standard of care it has a lot of significance because whenever a patient of curative or surgical patient come the if you dissect the data if you look at the trial you have to look at the primary endpoint what is the primary endpoint for curative patient don't go by the primary endpoint of disease free survival or progression free survival for curative patient the primary endpoint should be overall survival so my decision taking should be based on the overall survival data in adjuvant setting because this patient has shown disease free survival benefit in this trial and the overall survival data is yet to come i hope that overall survival will also be positive then i will definitely recommend so that's why i have called it as a a recommendation or a standard of care but not the standard of care so again in the as a some question in the checkmate 274 trial which have been discussed earlier the adjuvant setting we have used nivolumab and it has shown a uh, disease free survival benefit of almost 44 months so coming to the patient again so in both these scenarios if a patient comes to me and ask me is there any role for uh, immunotherapy should we proceed with immunotherapy my answer would be like yes again a standard new standard of care overall survival data yet to come till that overall survival did not come so i would be Uh, i will not offer immunotherapy in this setting so i will wait for the overall survival data but it has showing promising results so we have dealt with a non muscular invasive bladder carcinoma only phase 2 studies are there lot of uh, research ongoing on the phase 3 study in muscular invasive again i have told you pdl1 positive patients patients pre treated with uh, chemotherapy and patient tested positive for pdl1 has significant dfs benefit and going to be uh, hopefully that overall survival benefit will also come so hope because this data is uh, still maturing this patient has not received any uh, adjuvant neoter uh, immunotherapy and the patient was kept on follow up and after 12 months this patient has developed breathlessness and on evaluation with ct the patient has found to have multiple pulmonary and liver metastasis so from the curative setting now the patient has become uh, metastatic setting that is the palliative intent intent so the impression would be the 60 year old male no comorbidities metastatic ca urinary bladder and the sites of meds are lung and liver what next then comes the question of which dr uh, nareshwar has answered whether the patient is eligible for cisplatin whether the patient is eligible for carboplatin or whether the patient is not eligible for both cisplatin or carboplatin we will call it as platinum ineligible so what are the guidelines says and what is the uh, recommendation so sir has nicely pointed out uh, we have our own indian consensus statements also for this uh, cisplatin criteria platinum eligibility criteria so two points we should be stressing was creatinine clearance less than 60 neha class 3 hearing loss of grade 2 or neuropathy peripheral neuropathy these are the criteria which we will be using to classify whether the patient is cisplatin eligible or cisplatin ineligible so the dictum would be in metastatic carcinoma patient we have three options multiple trials are ongoing and they have combined three options first option was like 
just give them chemotherapy that is gemcitabine cisplatin or gemcitabine carboplatin and then observe when the patient developed progression then treat with the second line this is the first scenario second scenario along with the chemotherapy give immunotherapy that is continuation maintenance chemotherapy plus immunotherapy after four to six cycles stop the chemotherapy and then give immunotherapy alone this is the second uh, scenario and the third one was first give chemotherapy and after that immunotherapy and if the patient progress and then second line so among these three the most preferable one which we will choose was when compared to the wait and watch or when compared to the continuation maintenance the switch maintenance is the standard of care in the metastatic setting that means combine the chemotherapy and then first give chemotherapy for four to six cycles then do a response scan if the patient is responding then start the immunotherapy that is the switch maintenance and if the patient uh, progress on maintenance uh, immunotherapy then we can consider for the second line so next the next 10 slides i will be focusing on this switch maintenance that is first four to six cycles chemotherapy response assessment and then immunotherapy so this is the uh, evidence showing for the continuous continuation maintenance that is chemo plus immunotherapy has not shown any overall survival benefit that's why we have uh, switched to uh, switch maintenance that is chemotherapy followed by maintenance therapy uh, immunotherapy which has shown significant overall survival benefit so the guidelines also say the same if you look at this here if the patient is uh, eligible for cisplatin give gemcitabine cisplatin followed by avalumab maintenance for uh, till progression if the patient is ineligible for cisplatin give gemcitabine and carboplatin and followed by avalumab maintenance and then the question comes if the patient is ineligible for both cisplatin and carboplatin what needs to be done then just avoid chemotherapy and then you can give immunotherapy options like atezolizumab or pembrolizumab which i will discuss in the next slide so this is the trial which has shown the uh, which is backing up the evidence of this chemotherapy followed by maintenance immunotherapy javelin bladder 100 here you can see that they have taken stage 4 metastatic patients they have given 4 to 6 cycles of chemotherapy gemcis or gemcarbo and then do the response scan and after that they have given avalumab maintenance which is 10 mg per kg it has to be given every 2 weekly and the end point was overall survival as you can see the overall survival and the progression free survival was better in all the population overall population or even in the population tested for the pdl one so the question was as i mentioned previously this immunotherapy will work if the patient was tested positive for pdl one in the adjuvant setting so will that be the true for the metastatic setting also like is there going to be benefit for immunotherapy only for patients positive for pdl one or the benefit of immunotherapy will be there irrespective of the pdl one status that needs to be answered so what the recommendation says was the avalumab maintenance after completion of chemotherapy irrespective of the pdl1 status you can give avalumab maintenance that is immunotherapy till progression irrespective of the pdl1 status that is the first question and the second question would be can we consider avalumab irrespective of the chemotherapy like patient some patient has received gemcitabine cisplatin some patients received gemcitabine carboplatin is there any benefit or both the patient has shown the same result again Overall survival and progression free survival benefit with the avalumab immunotherapy maintenance was irrespective of the first line chemotherapy. So either you can use gemcitabine cisplatin if eligible for cisplatin, if ineligible for cisplatin use gemcitabine and carboplatin. That is the second question. And then the next question, how many cycles of chemotherapy would you prefer to give in your patients before starting avalumab? Guidelines say 4 to 6 cycles. Then how many cycles will you prefer to give? My practice would be whenever a patient comes to OPD, I will counsel for the 6 cycles. But after doing three or four cycles, I will do the response scan. If I feel that patient has responded well and there are any toxicities for the chemotherapy, then I will stop chemotherapy at four cycles and then I will start giving maintenance therapy. So, but the uh, trial was showing irrespective of the number of cycles. If you give four cycles, if you give five cycles, if you give six cycles, irrespective of the number of cycles, the benefit of avalumab immunotherapy was uh, significant in all the cases. So just see, counsel the patient for six cycles and upfront and just assess the toxicity after three to four cycles if you feel like patient has having significant toxicity then stop after four cycles if the patient is tolerating well then continue till six cycles and then followed by immunotherapy maintenance and then next the question was like so what chemotherapy we need to be given uh, how many cycles of chemotherapy we need to be given and whether we need to check the pdl1 status or not before uh, starting evolumab we have discussed and what is the response rates after giving four cycles a patient comes with complete response or partial response or some other patient comes with the uh, stable disease is it going to change the benefit with we are what we are getting with avalumab maintenance is the another question so the trial answer was 
irrespective of the response, except for the progressive disease, the, the patient develops complete response or partial response or stable disease, giving avalumab maintenance has shown similar results in all the patients. You can see over here, overall survival and progression-free survival, irrespective of the response, like complete response, partial response, stable response, stable disease, the benefit with immunotherapy is uh, there in all subjects. Next question. How soon will you like to start avalumab, chemotherapy, uh, avalumab post chemotherapy? For example, let's say a patient has completed four cycles of chemotherapy and then has done the response assessment scan after three weeks and it was showing any of the response like complete partial or stable disease. Will you wait for the, uh, immediately you will start the uh, maintenance immunotherapy or you will wait till six weeks or you will wait ten weeks. And so what does the data tell? Again, irrespective of the timing, four to ten weeks, whenever you want to start the immunotherapy, it has not shown any difference in the uh, benefit. So assess the response, assess the toxicity and then based on that you can start the immunotherapy post uh, chemotherapy. So again the next question, this is the most important question every patient will ask. Okay you have started me the avalumab, can I take it for one cycle, two cycles? Can I take it for one year? Can I take it for two years? How long should I take the immunotherapy? This is the question we should be able to answer. Again they have studied that some patients they have received 6 months, 12 months, 24 months, some patients still uh, progressive disease and what they have noted was prolonged immunotherapy till the patient has developed progressive disease or till the patient has developed toxicities. It has shown overall survival advantage. So my uh, answer to the patient would be I will continue the avalumab maintenance therapy to you if patient disease is under control. If you don't develop any grade 3 or grade 4 toxicity, I will be able to give you avalumab maintenance till progression. Clause was if you are able to afford it. Yes. So again, so coming back to my patient, patient, patient was again uh, metastatic CA uh, bladder, a patient has received 4 to 6 cycles of chemotherapy and then followed by avalumab maintenance till uh, progressive disease has been received. So again, next coming to the last and th uh, one last before slide, that is what if the patient is ineligible for both the platinums like cisplatin and carboplatin, then we can consider as Narasar said atezolizumab or pembrolizumab in patients who are not eligible for any platinum then up front, directly in the first line, we can use this atezolizumab or uh, pembrolizumab. Again, the data, I am not going to the deep, but the two trials, the pivotal trials were like IMYZ210 uh, or Keynote 52 trial, which has shown the benefit of this immunotherapy in patients who are not eligible for cis, uh, platinum agents. So, the same. So, the one last point, what if, so I have uh, told you number of cycles, how many cycles, still how long, but most of my patients, I am working over here for the past one year, so none of my patients has received avalumab maintenance, none of my patients would be affordable. When I am in TMH Mumbai, one or two patients hardly I have seen. But the question, the important question would be like, the patient has not taken any immunotherapy, completed chemotherapy and then start develop, uh, developing disease. That is in the a patient that develops progressive disease. So in the second line setting, can we consider immunotherapy? Yes, again, if the post platinum or other combination, if the patient has not received immunotherapy in the prior setting, then again pembrolizumab is the category 1 indication. If the patient has received already uh, immunotherapy, like what I have mentioned, av avalumab maintenance, then you have to consider for like other options like sir has mentioned enfotumab, vidotin or any chemotherapy basic option. So the last slide, I will just summarize it. Non-module invasive bladder carcinoma in BCG refractory, we have a role for pembrolizumab, but it is only phase 2 data. In the muscle invasive bladder carcinoma, in the adjuvant setting, we have data for the adjuvant immunotherapy and again, it has shown only DFS benefit, that is disease free survival, again I am insisting it is the A standard not the D standard. And the metastatic setting, yes, the first line avalumab maintenance has a significant overall survival benefit is there. If the patient is cisplatin eligible, give cisplatin based chemotherapy followed by avalumab maintenance. If the patient is cisplatin ineligible but eligible for carboplatin, give carboplatin based chemotherapy followed by avalumab maintenance. If the patient is not eligible for any platinum, just give IO immunotherapy. Thank you. I started using that low dose nevo plus carboxantinib in RCC, but as of now, no, it is not a good, I good idea to extrapolate data from head and neck cancers to all other sites. But hopefully, maybe if the uh, patient starts responding in other cancers, also it is a good thing. But we should not extrapolate the data from head and neck to all other sites. So, what is the cost factor that we are just for? Yes, sir. yes, to 90,000, and the patient has to take it every two weeks. Okay, so it will cost somewhere around 1.5 to 2 lakh for the patient. So the, even for the pembrolizumab, nivolumab also somewhere the same same cost. But the issue was the question would be like, what if the patient 
when the patient has taken four cycles chemotherapy and patient has taken started taking mm -hmm. immunotherapy the question what i have faced when i am in amh with kumar prabha sir was like the patient has received four cycles of maintenance and then patient developed into complete response and the next question patient was asking was sir there is no disease in my body so do i need to take that avalumab which will cost 1.5 to 2 lakhs every two weekly so that is the question which i don't think there is no answer sir can uh, highlight that one on that point but it is a better idea if the patient has developed uh, gone into complete response with avalumab so my preference would be if the patient is affordable then i would prefer to continue the avalumab maintenance that which is what finally that kumar uh, professor also advised but this is a common situation because i have seen three patients in tmh out of which one patient underwent into complete response but in spite of that we are continuing avalumab maintenance every two weeks the question would be patient has to come every two weekly uh, the cost is a concern coming to the your second question the side effect part he has like for every immunotherapy the side effect profile would be like any pneumonitis hypothyroidism thyroid uh, abnormality endocrinal abnormalities so these are the fatigue is the most common thing hypophysitis so these are the complications which we should be uh, encountering in patients receiving this immunotherapy